Come on, let's give the Lord a shout of praise. I don't know about you, but there is a fire on the inside of me. When I begin to look at people getting delivered, I wonder as we're watching that how some of you are unmoved by the power of God. I wonder how some of you are unmoved by the Holy Spirit that is moving right now in this place. There has to be a desperation on the inside of you that says, I am tired of coming into service after service after service and not getting delivered and not getting healed and not getting breakthrough. And I want to say I appreciate many of you that have flown in from the streams that follow us online and you might be sitting back and saying, Isaiah, it's just a little bit much. Does it take all that shouting? Does it take all that praising? Does it take all that dancing? And my answer is it doesn't take all of that if you want to stay in dead casual and dry religion. If you want to stay complacent, if you want to stay demonized, if you want to be a dry Christian, then you can stay where you're at. When Pastor Vlad called me to come preach, he said, last time you came, we weren't ready for you. We got freaked out a little bit. He said, but this time we're ready for your preaching. So do me a favor. Don't prove him wrong. But I want to give you liberty tonight to shout like you've never shouted. I want to give you liberty tonight to praise like you've never praised. I want to give you liberty tonight to lift up your voice and to push back against every demonic power, against every demonic force. I heard the Lord in worship saying, we got the enemy against the ropes tonight. Tonight we are here to wage a war. And if you didn't know, you came to deliverance service. So I'm not going to apologize for having a radical praise. I'm not going to apologize for having a radical shout. I wonder why some of you are embarrassed about the praise that saves you. I am not ashamed of the worship that delivered me. Who am I preaching to tonight? I am not ashamed of the shout that breaks demonic powers. I am not ashamed of the altar that healed me and delivered me. It's time to stop apologizing to demons. Sorry, Mr. Demon, we're mad that we made you uncomfortable. I came, I came to stir it up tonight. Some of you are already growling, shaking, and rolling around. We came to put our eye against the king into the kingdom of darkness and to violently wage war against his kingdom. God is looking for a church that has an attitude. God is looking for a church that is violent. God is looking for a church that is militant. We are done with the nursery. There are too many wimps in the pulpit. And God is saying, I am raising up warriors out of the dry bones of the American church. Is it true the church is dry? Absolutely. I've been traveling for 10 years, preached all over the country, and I've lost track of how dry, how many churches I've been in where there is no presence and there is no power. That we're getting 100 messages a day on Instagram and Facebook of people saying, my church refused to pray for deliverance. My church refuses to pray for healing. And some of y'all are saying, you better preach because you flew in from a church like that. But I heard the Lord say that in the midst of the dry bones of the American church, I am getting ready to raise up an army. I'm getting ready to raise up some people that say, I don't want a pacifier. I want a sniper rifle. God is raising up spiritual snipers that are doing engage in warfare, that your prayers break strongholds, your worship breaks demonic powers, your fasting increases power, that God is releasing something, and God is not looking for dry Christians. In fact, the devil's attracted to dry believers. The Bible says when the demon goes out, it looks for a dry place to rest, but finds none. Friend, demons rest on dry believers. Some of you say, I don't understand why there's so much warfare in my life. I'm not doing anything for the kingdom of God. And yet there's perpetual demonic warfare. It's because the devil is attracted to dryness. That dry, dead, casual, complacent, callous Christianity where you sit back every week 
week and you're all excited about the promotion. You're all excited about the sport. You're all excited about the things of the culture. But God is saying, you come into my house and I'm wondering where the passion is. I'm wondering where the excitement is. I'm wondering where the fire is. When are we going to get to a place where we don't need anybody to beg us to engage? We don't need anyone to beg us to worship. We don't need anyone to beg us to be excited. Friend, I want to be like blind Bartimaeus. I want to shout. I want to praise. Demons are not intimidated by quiet Christians trying to wrestle and wonder why we're not getting breakthrough and God says demons are not intimidated by dryness in fact there are days where I get up and I shout and I praise loud not because God doesn't hear me but because I'm making war friend you've come into this house I know some of you came with good intentions I know some of you came with ill intentions it's okay we have witches and warlock come to most of our services but friend I want to tell you when you get in this atmosphere where the power and the Holy Spirit is beginning to move when you get in this atmosphere, you got to understand uh, that we did not come to give you information. Uh, we did not come to give you three points and a poem about nothing. Uh, we did not come to tickle your ears uh, or make the hair stand up on your back. Uh, we came to shift things in the heavenlies. Uh, the Bible says that we have power in heavenly places. Uh, friend, that you've been given direct access to God. Uh, the Bible says that you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Uh, that whatever you bind on on earth, God says, I'm going to go ahead and bind it up in the spirit realm. Whatever you loose on the earth, I'm going to go ahead and loose it in the spirit realm. We are in a cosmic supernatural wrestling match against demonic forces. And God is raising up churches that are going to begin to engage in warfare. The days of waiting are over. God says engage. A little bit more in the mic. Stop waiting around for the enemy to come. He says, I'm going to rise up a church, Peter, and the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. That means you've been anointed, not Isaiah, not Pastor Vlad, not the leadership team of this church, but God has called you. He said, I have anointed you. I have mandated you. I have called you. I have equipped you. I have stamped you. I have marked you. I have sealed you with the power and the authority to be offensive against the gates of hell, to be battering rams in God's kingdom against demonic strongholds. Uh, friend, do you know what it means to be aggressive? Uh, it means that I'm going to go against his strategies uh, even before his strategies play out. Uh, in fact, Paul says to know the devil's strategies uh, so that the devil will not have an advantage over you. Uh, the devil has had an advantage over the American church uh, because we are so busy uh, with our coffee shops, our donuts, uh, and our good-looking preachers uh, that we have lost track that the church was never a nice place for your family. Show me one verse where the church was a Sunday morning gathering, where we have coffee and donuts, people come in demonized, and people come in sick, and people come in depressed, uh, and all, the, all we do is preach them into bondage with our lukewarm preaching, uh, and our lukewarm altar calls. Friend, we are sleeping as the church, uh, and I'm telling you, we have failed America uh, when it comes to deliverance and healing, uh, and then we wonder, why do our friends not want to come to church? Uh, why do our friends not want to be deliverant, be, want to do deliverance, or want to be a part of the move of God? It's because we have lost the power that distinguishes us from the world. Friend, let me tell you, the only thing that we have to offer this world is not nice lights, which I love the nice lights, is not a nice sound system, which God knows I love the nice sound system, is not screens or laser beams. Praise God, we got enough laser beams to attract a UFO. That is not what makes demons run. I have yet to meet a demonized person and the light shine on them and then get delivered. I've yet to have a demonized person person look at our nice screen uh, and get delivered I've yet to put my bachelor's degree on a demon uh, I have yet to oh I'm a pastor and then the demon has to leave uh, no the only thing that we have to oh, oh I feel like preaching tonight uh, y'all are making y'all are making me sweat uh, the only thing that we have that distinguishes us uh, is the manifest presence and power of God uh, without his power we are nothing without his power 
So let me ask you this question because I know I'm preaching deliverance, but I'm going to challenge you. When's the last time you've used the power of God in the last weeks and the last months? Friend, we are living our lives with no vacuums. There is no areas of our life where we actually need the manifest presence of God. And you wonder why is God not showing up in our everyday life? Why is it that we've lost the passion? If some of you were real, you've lost your passion for prayer. You've lost your passion for fasting. The way I know is because the only time you pray is in the house of God. It's because you have lost your passion. Some of you have lost your passion for worship. How do you know? Because a minute into raising your hands, your mind has been sidetracked by the cares of this world. You've lost your desire to get alone in the secret place. We could think about the last week or two or month or six months and go, God, I can't remember God the last time I got in the secret place. I can't remember the last time I felt the conviction of your word. I can't remember the last time the word pierced me like a two-edged sword. I can't remember the last time I wept in the presence of God. And we have so many groupies in the American church, but we don't have disciples. We don't have people that say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to be in relationship with you. I want to demonstrate and manifest. Come on, help me, y'all. It's getting quiet up in this Catholic church. But I want your presence to be made manifest in my life. Without the presence of God, you have nothing. So why doesn't the presence of God show up in our churches, show up in our everyday lives? God will never come to a place he's tolerated, only to a place he's celebrated. And the Bible makes it clear in the book of Revelation that there will be an end time church where Jesus is outside the door of the church. Friend, do you want to know why deliverances are not happening at 99% of the American church? Do you want to know why miracles are not happening in 99% of the American church? It's because God is absent in the church. God is nowhere to be found. And we are preaching a watered down gospel that is void of the presence of God. It's no wonder why we have three minute altar calls. It's no wonder why your ads on your favorite sitcom are longer than our altar calls. It's no wonder we'll wait in the drive through of Starbucks longer than we'll wait at the altar for the presence of God. It's because God is not present. And when God doesn't show up we have to fabricate we have to fabricate and preach things like demons don't exist for Christians it's not that demons don't exist for Christians it's the church has lost the delivering power of God and so because we're not doing deliverance we've justified it and this is what we say Pastor Vlad well if deliverance isn't happening in my church it must not be real and we create and I'm sorry I'm just gonna say how I mean it because they invited me to preach I didn't invite myself we've created doctrines of demons that say oh the deliverance is not for the church yet in Matthew you 10 Jesus sent the disciples to go drive out demons and here's what he told them he said I don't want you going to the world and I don't want you going to the Samaritan he said I want you to go drive out demons among my chosen people deliverance is the children's bread oh I wish somebody would help me up in here deliverance is for the church deliverance is for every believer I wish I had somebody in here that says, I came to get delivered. I came to get set free. I came to get breakthrough. I came to get a miracle. I did not come to get goosebumps. I came to get the demons that have been renting my spiritual house, evicted by the power of Almighty God. We came to serve the devil in eviction notice but we call demons issues in the church. Oh brother, you just have an issue. No, you don't, you have a spirit of fornication. Oh sister, you're just struggling with control. No, you have a Jezebel spirit. And the church of Thyatira, the, way, the reason why God rebuked them is because they tolerated. It wasn't that they advocated, they tolerated.
tolerated demonic spirits in the church and they were able to host the presence of God and demonic spirits in the same building without any confrontation happening. But friend, what you have to understand about the kingdom of God is that the kingdom of God clears out and destroys satanic kingdoms. That the kingdom of God is established in deliverance. And he said, I have this against you. You've tolerated Jezebel to teach in your church. Some of you this today are in denial and you've tolerated demonic powers and we've gotten used to our demons. I've done deliverances where two, three, four hours will go by and I'm going, what is going on? And after three hours, they'll say, I'm just so used to having these demons. I don't know what I would do without them because the demons interweave into our personality. Remember the devil works and the realm of the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions are the playground for demonic spirit. And they have so interwoven into our minds and they've convinced us our antichrist doctrines and our antichrist preaching is biblical and that is why Paul said I'm worried that you're bringing in different spirits and you're preaching a different Jesus what was Paul saying Paul was saying that in the last days there would be a Jesus that was introduced to the church that was not the Jesus that does deliverance are y'all hearing me today that is not the Jesus that heals that is not the Jesus Jesus that preaches repentance that is not the Jesus that preaches hell that is not the Jesus that preaches the broad and narrow road but there would be a sanitized there would be a nice casual Jesus that says come on Sunday morning give me your hour and a half of your leftover lukewarm time give me a leftover shout give me a leftover worship give me a leftover praise never change challenge demonic powers and we're just going to pacify you and spoon feed you and everything will be fine and Paul says that is a demonic Jesus a Jesus that says you don't have to cast out devils you don't have to heal. Let's say, let's, let's not raise our hands on this portion. And the last year, have I cast out a devil? And the last year, have I healed the sick? And the last year, have I made a disciple? And the last year, have I baptized anybody? And the last year, have I preached to anybody? And the last year, have I gotten the secret place at least 10 minutes? And we'd say, no, 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 no to every one of those things. And yet we've lived our lives in delusion, calling ourselves believers. And the question is, we, what are we believers in church? And an hour and a half on Sunday morning, that is why Paul said when I came to you I came frail and weak without the wisdom of man because I wanted you to rely on the power of God I want to bring demonstration and this is what Paul said so that your faith would not be in me but that your faith would be in the power of God yet because we are so good at the art of preaching and professional Christianity we know what song to sway on when to get on our knees when to jump when to shout but meanwhile from Monday till Saturday night we are servants of demonic powers and this is why Elijah on Mount Carmel said I want you to stop haltering between two opinions if God is God then serve God but if Baal is Baal serve Baal because you're always trying to serve both that's why you're exhausted because at work you're one person at church you're another person at school you're one person at church you're another person and you come and cry and say why does nobody want to be Christian because nobody wants to be like you nobody wants to be halfway in and halfway out from there is no benefit in being halfway in and halfway out I tell young people all the time you might as well go be the best partier and the best sinner you could be because God is not interested in our leftover time God is not interested in our half-hearted worship God is no longer convincing people the Lord told me two weeks ago he said Isaiah I I'm out of the season of trying to convince the church on deliverance. If you follow me on the stream, many of you do. I've spent the last four months of my life, I prepared 12 to 15 hours every stream that I preach on deliverance, praying and praying. And so many of those times, Pastor Vlad, I was preparing to convince. I was preparing to show scripture as to why deliverance is biblical and why salvation means deliverance and why every believer is called to do it. And God has been giving me download revelation strategies. He said, Isaiah, I'm setting the enemy's camps on fire and I'm giving their strategies over to the church. I'm giving the plans and the strategies that Satan has so hid 
committed from the church for years to those that will willingly pursue the kingdom of God. God says, I'm raising up spiritual snipers and special force believers that are going to wage war. They're not going to wait around, but they're going to infiltrate the second heaven. Their prayers are going to lose legions of angels. And the Bible says in Hebrews that angels are the ministering spirits of God that have been sent to serve the heirs of salvation. And tonight, what you don't realize is even as we're preaching, there are angels beginning to make war. Friend, you got to know that there is a real devil in the parking lot that is prowling the parking lot, waiting to say who will be his after the service is over. But I came to put my finger in the eye of every demon. I came to bind every demonic spirit. I came to put the enemy on notice. I am not going to convince the church any longer of the Bible. We spend hours convincing. This is scriptural. This is scriptural. You want to know why, Pastor Vlad, we have to spend hours convincing our churches that deliverance is scriptural? Because our churches don't read the Bible. Our churches only go to Sunday. Friend, do you know that an hour and a half on Sunday morning is less than statistically 1% of your week? And we have such a weak, pathetic Christianity in America that we call 1% of our time Christianity. We say, well, I'm a believer. Why? Because I go to church for less than 1% of my week. And you think you're going to stand before God on the day of judgment. And God is going to say, well done when you did not nothing for his kingdom. One day the Lord said, Isaiah, many Christians will not hear well done because they have not done anything, but rather they will be well done in the fiery lake, the lake of fire, because that is a place for people that have been deceived by the spirit of religion. Some of you are getting mad tonight. That's the devil. Some of you are getting mad tonight. That's religion. Religion hates confrontation. Religion hates, they love to conceal. They don't want to confront. Religion hates loud noises. The prodigal son's older brother said, what's all the noise for? Friend, we are raising up a war. Demons are not threatened by quiet Christians. I was like, well, I prayed for deliverance and the person didn't get delivered or manifest. You didn't pray for deliverance. You said, I'll be praying for you. That's one of the most demonic things we can do in the church. People come up to us as pastors and they say, uh, uh, Pastor, I need prayer. I'm demonized. I'm having thoughts. Uh, I'm having dominating thoughts. People often ask, I have a, a sheet of about 60 plus symptoms of being demonized. Uh, and people say, how do I know? And I always say, do, are your thoughts being dominated? Uh, Ephesians 6 talks about rulers. These are world dominators. Uh, the devil is a dominator. God does not dominate. God does not force. Uh, God will not kick down the door of your life and barge himself in. Uh, but the devil, the Bible says, crouches and waits at the door, and he barges his way in if you give him a crack. He wants to dominate the real estate of your mind. He wants to dominate the real estate of your emotion. He wants to put down a down payment on you and own property in your life. He wants to rent the spiritual house of your life. And how many know that when renters move in, they don't take care of the property? How many know that when renters move in, they mess up the wallpaper. They scuff up the carpet. They mess up the grass because they didn't pay for the property so they don't care about the property. And friend, you have been paid for by the blood of Jesus. There was a high price paid so that you can live in right relationship with God. There is a high price paid, yet we've settled for crumbs. I often say we've settled for back, we've settled for nosebleed seats when God says, I've given you a backstage pass in the spirit realm. I've not made you. In fact, you were made in the spirit before you were made in the natural. How do you know? Because Jeremiah, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. How could God know a person before they were a physical person? Because God says, I made you spirit before I made you natural. Adam was made spirit before Adam was made natural. God says, I have made you to be a spirit being. Jesus said, when you are born again, you are born again in another dimension. Nicodemus said, I'm religious, so I don't understand. What are you talking about? about. Is this like a sinner's prayer? I pray at an altar. And Jesus said, Nick, you're not getting it. When you're born again, you're born into another dimension. You no longer live your life by what your eyes see. You live your life by what your spiritual eyes see. You no longer live your life by what's happening in the natural, but you live your life moving around in the spiritual. You begin to understand that we are at war against personalities that have no flesh and no blood. These are people that are not 
natural people. And the Bible says these are the things we war against. And our weapons are not natural. Our weapons are spiritual. You've been given spiritual weapons, so why are they in your closet? Why don't we use them? Why don't we say terms like assaulting Satan's kingdom? Assaulting what? What are you talking about? I prayed a prayer nine years ago at an altar, and Jesus came into my heart and built a tree house. And I've lived my life Sunday to Sunday on life support. From the American church is on life support, waiting for Jesus to come back, not realizing he has already sent the Holy Spirit for us to establish his government on the earth. Jesus has called you for a global takeover in the spirit. You have been anointed. You have been called. You've been mandated and you've been commanded to do deliverance on other people. Isaiah, I just don't know if it's my calling. It is your calling according to the word of God. So he calls the 12 and he says, I'm commanding you to go cast out devils. And let me tell you why we don't cast out demons because we take God's word as God's opinion. And God says, my word is not my opinion. It's my commandment. That means there's more than 10 commandments. That means, now I'm going to freak some of you out here and it's okay. We're going to have some deliverance here at the altar. So just if you start manifesting, you'll be good. Give me another 10, about 10 Pentecostal minutes. But we stress out and we have anxiety and then we don't think it's sin. So we never repent over it. And stress and anxiety becomes an open door for demonic powers. How could you say that? Because Jesus commanded us not to worry about tomorrow for it today has enough worries in itself and rebuke the disciples for being faithless when they stressed out. See, not stressing and not being anxious is not God's option or God's opinion. It's God's commandment. And when you break and violate the commandments of God, you are putting yourself in position to be under the curse. The Bible makes it clear there's only curses or blessings. You are either living under the curse or you're living under the blessing. Well, I thought Jesus broke the curse. He did. He broke the curse of sin and he broke the curse of the law. That is what your Bible says. But there are other curses that we put ourselves in when we open the doors to demonic powers. And we try, well, I'm a believer. How could, I'm telling you, if you open the door, you don't get to pick what comes through the door. And the church of America has opened up the door to Jezebel. We've opened up the door to Delilah. We've opened up the door to Ahab and Herod. And when they come in, we try to rebuke them. But you don't have power to rebuke something you're sleeping with. You don't have power to rebuke something you're in agreement with. And God is trying to choose tonight whose side you're on. God is trying to sever the head of the snake. God is trying to sever the head of that python divination spirit and say, you need to choose what side you're on. See, the disciples were talking about the love of God, and this is what we've done in the church with deliverance. We've said, brother, will you just preach Jesus? Would you just preach love? Understand, there are many believers right now in this room that are in love with Jesus, but not in love with what Jesus does. And Jesus says, you can't love me and not love the things that I do. And Jesus started his ministry openly confronting the devil. The Bible says after he got baptized, immediately what happened? The Bible says he went into the wilderness led by the Spirit. It wasn't the devil that led Jesus to the devil. It was the Holy Spirit that led Jesus to the devil. Why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus to the devil? Because first John says uh, that the Son of God appeared on the earth uh, that he might destroy the works of Satan. Uh, the very reason Jesus came uh, was to destroy the work of Satan. Uh, demons fulfill the work of Satan. So Jesus says, and you can tell this to all your hippie Christian friends that don't believe in deliverance or miracles. Jesus said, I came for one reason, and that's to destroy the devil's works. That's why deliverance was the only ministry that Jesus did that nobody else in the Bible did. Remember, they had already raised the dead. They had already healed the sick. And John the Baptist was already preaching repentance. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up on the scene. And for the first time in history, in Mark chapter 1, Jesus begins to speak to a demon in the church. And the demon immediately begins to obey him. 
him. And the religious people begin to scratch their PhDs and say, we don't understand how this man has authority. What authority were they talking about? Spiritual authority over demonic forces. They did not understand that when Jesus spoke to demons, the demons had to obey him. From this is what I love about Jesus. He said, I'm going to leave. And when I leave, I am giving you all power and I'm giving you all authority over demonic spirits. You've been given authority in heavenly places, but authority is worthless if you don't exercise it. You've been given power. So this is what we have to ask ourselves. What have we done with the power that God has given us? Posted a couple of verses on Facebook. Witches and warlocks are meeting for 10 to 12 hours every single day. Astro projecting. I've talked to some of them, y'all, and they're spending hours and hours. You know what? They want out. They want to get saved. They want to get delivered. But think about this. What, where will the witches and warlocks go? What churches can we send them to when they want to come out of 12 hours of astro projecting a day? Are we going to send them to our little lukewarm coffee shop cappuccino churches where we're meeting once a week for a 25 minute Starbucks study where 15 of those minutes we're posting pictures that we're reading the Bible and Instagram to that everybody thinks we're more spiritual than we really are. Friend, these witches and warlocks are going to begin to laugh when they get saved because they're going to say, how is it? Now, you guys have John Ramirez. He's a friend of mine. They're going to say, how is it we would astro project for 12 hours to a God that had less power and you guys can't pray for more than 20 minutes? Oh, yeah, turn on the office and you'll watch an entire season. But when it comes to the things of God, you're dead asleep in five minutes. And God is saying, I'm overlooking and I'm done with people that need to be convinced of what my word already says. Friend, any time I read the Bible and I disagree with it, I have one conclusion I come up with. Either the Bible's wrong or I must be wrong. And what if you spent more time trying to change your life than trying to change the Bible? What if you spent more time not trying to bend the Bible to fit your life, but starting to bend your life to fit the Bible? What would happen if you spent more time believing everything you read, not on CNN, ABC, or Fox News, but when you opened up the scriptures and you said, I don't need ABC, I don't need Fox News or CNN, I need Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to begin to become alive in my life. I need to be get trained and equipped for spiritual warfare. I am tired of believing what the culture and what religion says. God is breaking the demonic spirit of religion that has silenced the voice of deliverance, that has silenced his power. In fact, do you know the only biblical way to establish his kingdom is through deliverance? Jesus told them in Matthew 12, when I cast out a demon by the finger of God, surely you know the kingdom of God has been established in that place. That means the only way to effectively establish God's kingdom on the earth. You say, Isaiah, I'm an ambassador. How do I establish the kingdom of God on the earth? I asked this question for years and God began to reveal to me that there is only one biblical way to establish his kingdom on the earth. And that is through the, the realm or the process of deliverance. He said, if I cast a demon out by my finger, you'll know the fingerprint of God is come upon you. Why did he tell that? Because the Pharisees were accusing him of being of the devil by casting out demons. And Jesus took the Pharisees back to Exodus where all of a sudden Moses is who God, Moses was battling Pharaoh's magicians. And when Moses and Aaron were doing signs and wonders and Pharaoh's magicians were also doing signs and wonders because remember the satanic kingdom has power. It just doesn't have all power. And that's why Ephesians 6 says we wrestle. We we are in a wrestling match against demonic power. That those witches and warlocks do have power. They just don't have power over us because we've been given all power. They've been given some power. And so Jesus takes them back to that time where Pharaoh's magician said, we can't handle this and we can't fight you. We can't fight God's people. And Jesus said the finger of God, Pharaoh's people said the finger of God must become upon them or they must be doing this by the finger of God. And Jesus brings the religious people people back to Exodus and say, understand that when I drive out a demon, it is the finger of God establishing his government on the earth every time a demon comes out. Now, what you need to understand when you're casting out demons is you're going against the entire satanic kingdom. So you might be, 
I started delivering to my living room. I've done deliverances in cars. I've done deliverances in sheds. I've done deliverances in homes, basements, closets. I mean, you name it, I've cast demons out in every place you could think of. In our early days, we were driving out demons outside, inside, parking lots. We didn't care. Everywhere we went, we were praying for our old party friends, our atheist friends, our drug addict friends that were coming in and getting saved. They would get full of the Holy Ghost saved, and then two days later, they'd be slithering up the wall like a snake. And we begin to drive out demons, and God began to show me, and you need to catch this, but every time you drive out a demon, tonight as we're casting demons out of people, we are weakening the global satanic kingdom at large, that we are not going up against you and your little demon. We are going the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of Satan, and only one kingdom's walking out tonight, and that is the kingdom of Almighty God. God wants to establish, come on, somebody raise up a shout. God wants to establish his kingdom in your life and on the earth. Jesus says, if I drive out a demon, the kingdom is being established. So Pastor Vlad, deliverances aren't happening in 99% of churches. I'm being nice about that statistic, by the way. So then what are we establishing? Because Jesus said, you're not establishing my kingdom. You're establishing your kingdom. There is an antichrist king. I know I won't get shouts here. There is an antichrist kingdom being built in the American church, and we're calling it the kingdom of God. And let me tell you why it's not the kingdom of God. Because the moment you announce a prayer meeting, 10 people show up. And the moment you announce Isaiah's coming into town or some evangelist is coming into town, the place has a line around the building because they're coming for man, not coming for God. And God says, I am looking for believers and churches that are not going to establish, friend, I came to tell you, it is time to crush all of your little dreams and all of your little ambitions of oh I want to be a great preacher and have a lot of followers friend I only want people to follow me as I follow Christ I only want to be an ambassador of the kingdom of God I'm telling you it is time to rage war someone was just saying why Isaiah you do know October is the devil's month and I told them they might have an open portal in the month of October but we have an open door every single day every single month that the spirit of God is open for business and God says my angels are bored and they're ready to be dispatched onto the earth and they've been waiting to fight friend your angels have been sharpening their swords I want to I want you to think about how bored your angels have been sharpening their swords up in heaven going Michael are they ever going to call upon me to come fight why are they down there wrestling around with their flesh, wrestling around with chaotic demons? Friend, do you know why the devil will get you chasing around one little demon for 10 years? Because you'll be ineffective in second heaven warfare and spiritual warfare if you live your life chasing your own little demons and fighting your own powers. And God says, I want to deliver you so that you can make an impact in my global kingdom so that the angels will be released. Do you know the angels are just waiting on you to open up your mouth and release them? The Bible, what did Jesus say? Jesus Jesus said this, that do you not know in the garden when the, Peter's ch trying to chop people's head off, had horrible aim, and is cutting people's ears off? Jesus said, do you all not know that any moment I could pray to my Father and have him send thousands of angels to rescue us and to deliver us at any moment? Jesus gave us insight to one of the greatest spiritual realities, that by praying to the Father, we have the ability to release legions of angels into our situation uh, that Daniel 10 that will begin to fight uh, to liberate, co co liberate communities and people. Uh, what would happen if we tapped into the spiritual weapons uh, that God has given us uh, and we stopped trying to wrestle each other on Facebook? Uh, friend, do you know why the church is so busy, busy fighting each other? Because they've not used the energy God has allocated and given us to fight spiritual battles uh, that we're used to fighting each other. Uh, but God is saying you won't even have time to fight each other if you fight the spiritual realm. People call me Pastor Vlad. Did you hear about so-and-so's ministry? Are you going to post about what John MacArthur said? Are you going to post about what Donald Trump just said? Are you going to post about Black Lives Matter? Are you going to post? I'm going, I don't even know what. I don't even have time to spend energy trying to gossip and trying to post about all these other ministries. I'm engaged in a wrestling match with demonic spirits and I'm pinning down demons and I'm casting them out and I'm establishing God's kingdom. Friend, you should go to bed at night exhausted because you've been in spiritual warfare all day long. God has called us as a church to spiritual warfare. God is saying no more cowards. 
the word came to Gideon, 30,000 men. And God said, Gideon, this is what's happening in the mega church. And I'll be careful because I know I'm live on all of our platforms. This is what he said to Gideon. He said, Gideon, there's 30,000 and you got a group of cowards is what you got. And it looks like you got a huge, massive church, but you just got a bunch of cowards that don't want to fight. And God said, I want you to tell all the cowards to go home. And two thirds of Gideon's armies left. Friend, right now, I prophesied last year that mega churches were going to get emptied out. I had no clue about COVID or the pandemic. And I don't believe the reason why mega churches are getting emptied out is because of COVID. I believe that God is filtering and God is cutting off dead branches and God is sending the cowards home. God is saying, if you're a coward, just go home because I'm raising up a violent army and there's no room for cowards in my army. There's no room for babies in my army. There's no room for pacifier Christians in my army. He said, tell all the cowards to go home. The Bible said there's 10,000 left. And God says, there's still too many. All I need is 300. All I need is 300 men that are going to give me honor and give me glory and engage in warfare because the days of pacifying is over. Pacifier preachers. uh, Friend, do you know a pacifier is for babies that are not hungry? It just gives them a stimulation and it tricks their mind into thinking they're being fed when they're not even being fed. Do you know how many thousands of messages I've gotten in the last six months? Uh, And this is not to boast. This is to show you the temperature of the church. Uh, And people said, Isaiah, for 50 years, uh, I've been sitting in church thinking I was getting the word, thinking I was getting fed, but I realized that I am spiritually starving and I'm not doing anything the Bible says to do. It's because you've had a pastor that has shoved a pacifier in your mouth, tried to convince you you're being fed the word as long as he could get your 10%, but God does not want your 10%. God says, I want 100%. I want to raise you up to be a deliverer. I want to raise you up to drive out demons. I have anointed and I have called you. Let me close. Let me close. One more Pentecostal minute. I'm I'm in my intro and I'm 50 minutes in, by the way. I haven't even started my message. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. We're here for prayer. We're here for deliverance. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, do you not know that Satan's kingdom cannot be divided and still stand? That there is a strategic, organized kingdom that Satan borrowed from when he was up in heaven that has been established in the second heaven. There's no scripture in the Bible where it says the devil's ruling from hell. Friend, Revelation 20 says the devil's going to get thrown into hell for all of eternity. The devil is not running hell. Hell is not the devil's dwelling place. It's his sentence and his end end location. The devil is not ruling the world from hell. The devil is alive and well, roaming the earth. The Bible says there is an adversary that's prowling around like a lion. The devil is in the second heaven calling shots and doing all of his little thing. And we're sitting down here and we're playing games and we're playing religion and we are ignorant to the devil's devices. And God says, I'm looking for people that would begin to strategize against the enemy's kingdom. I'm looking for people that would begin to make war. I am tired of trying to justify and convince religious people. I used to comment back, oh, it says this and give them all the verses. And God said, why are you throwing your pearls to swine? We don't argue with demons. We cast them out. And that religious demon has grown so strong. And it has preached a gospel that is anti-Christ, anti-deliverance. And the Pharisees begin to tell Jesus, you're of the devil for doing deliverance. Jesus said, kingdom divided can't stand. And then Jesus goes into something mind-blowing. He talks about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Vlad, I preached on this wrong a hundred times. I said, well, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you deny the work of the Holy Spirit and then you stand before God and he can't forgive you because it's rear one. And then God says, that's not at all what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. Go read the text in Matthew 12. The text was the Pharisees mad at Jesus for casting out demons, accusing deliverance of being of the devil and bringing glory to Satan's kingdom. They accused Jesus saying, when you do deliverance, you're glorifying the enemy. When you preach on deliverance, you're glorifying the enemy. When when you preach on casting out demons, you're glorifying the kingdom of darkness. We should not talk about it so much. And Jesus said the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you attribute the work of deliverance to a work of Satan. Because the moment he said they rebuke him, he says, do you not know that anyone that blasphemes the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven, that the Son can't even forgive you? It's when you begin to say, this can't be of God. This is too spiritual. You know what blows my mind in the church of today? 
okay? There's nobody in this room that has ever told their kids, oh, don't be too smart. Oh, don't be too educated. Oh, don't work too hard. Oh, don't be too committed. Yet the moment we begin to get spiritual, all the crusty, dusty, dead religious people gather around and say, brother, don't be too spiritual. Friend, do you know the term, don't be so heavenly high or no earthly good was invented by demons? Every day you should be living in the heavenly realms. Friend, when you begin to catch this and you begin to live in the spirit, your life won't feel like it's an accident. Your life won't feel so chaotic. When you begin to understand and realize there are forces trying to bring depression on you. There are forces trying to bring anxiety on you. There are forces dominating your thoughts and God has given us jurisdiction to evict them tonight. Jesus said when somebody gets delivered it's like kicking out a tenant from a house. But Jesus makes it clear that we all are spiritual houses and we choose what we allow in our houses. And some of you have prayer in one room and you have lust in the other room. And you've given prayer the closet and you've given deception the master bedroom and God says it is time to evict these demonic powers I do not want to share you with the enemy that is why your Bible says I am a jealous God because God is not willing to share your time with demons let me close Psalms talks about that idolatry is literally an open door to demonic powers when Samuel came to, uh, came to, uh, Samuel came to Saul and began to rebuke him and say, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Most people don't catch this. He said, stubbornness is the sin of idolatry. The Bible says that if you serve an idol, you will become like the idol. Friend, there is a great idol that many of us worship in our land. Yes, that's a new iPhone. Thank you to my mother-in-law, father-in-law who just bought me this. Praise the Lord for that. But this iPhone has become such a massive idol in America. They say back in the day, Nebuchadnezzar used to ring a bell and and everybody would bow down and worship the golden idol. And now we, the Nebuchadnezzar doesn't have to ring a bell. Our phone beings. And what do we do? We all bow our head down before our idol. And we spend our day worshiping the apple instead of worshiping Yahweh. This is no different than the golden idol they bow down to. You spend most of your life bow down. I went to World Revival Church, Pastor Vlad, a couple years ago. I was preaching there and during worship, you know, you go to all these different churches, you see all these manifestations, and I just try to blend in and do whatever they're doing. So if they're falling out, I'm falling out. If they're loud, loud if they're speaking in tongues, I'm, I'm just trying to blend in. And all of a sudden, halfway through worship, I've never seen this in my life. Every single one of them start doing this. Every single one, the whole church is doing this. I didn't know what they were doing. I said, oh man, are they, do they all have back pain at once and they're all stretching out? I mean, I had no clue. I was thinking maybe Luke 13, the woman that was bent over, maybe it's just, I don't know what it is. And I looked at the pastor and I just did it with him. I just said, okay, y'all, whatever this is, let's just all do it. And so I'm standing there like this and I'm thinking, what in the world are we even doing? And I looked at the pastor. I said, pastor, what is everybody doing? He said, we're bowing before the king. See, I didn't know that bowing down was not laying down, was not kneeling down. It was merely putting your head and looking straight to to the ground and God says the enemy has got the church to bow before idols and idolatry is an open door to demonic spirit. I Bible says when you worship idols, this is in your Bible, you can Google it. It says you become like the idol that you worship. The Bible will go on to tell us that idols have eyes but they don't see. This represents Christians that are spiritually blind, which is what fill the American church. The Bible says idol ha idols have ears but they don't hear. The American church has grown deaf into the spiritual realm. The Bible says idols have mouths, but they don't speak. Believers are so afraid to speak out for the gospel and speak out for the things of God. Friend, understand we have become idols. I'm not saying you worship idols. I'm saying you have become an idol. The Bible says you become what you worship. And the Bible says stubbornness is the sin of idolatry. So if I put a little golden calf on the altar, not one of you would come and bow down before it. But God says, every time you're stubborn, that's exactly what you're doing. When you sit back in your high horse of religion and say, oh, this message isn't for me. I don't need breakthrough. I don't need deliverance. I don't need, if I can get the worship team to come up, I don't need the fire of God in my life. I don't need to change. I'm already doing everything God has called me to do. I'm already, and God says, every single one of us in this place, we have all bowed before the idols of society and the idols of culture. That is why you have no problem working 15 hours for your real estate job, yet you're building nothing for God's kingdom because you have 
of worship the idol of the American dream. Friend, do you know what makes you ineligible for revival? It's not heroin or cocaine. It's normal and it's average. The Bible says when the call went out, they did not receive the call because they were busy, because they just got married, they just bought property, and they just had oxen. And so God had to go outside the church and raise up an atheist and raise up drug addicts and raise up prostitutes because the church was too casual and the church was too comfortable with the status quo of the American nightmare that they weren't willing to pick up a cross and do, come on, y'all are making me work tonight and to fulfill the call that God has placed on their life. Excuses. It's the busyness of life that hinders us from revival. Let me give you one last revelation and then I'm going to close. Paul said, Timothy, do not know that you're a soldier. And he said, good soldiers don't get tied up. Think about this. Tied up in civilian life. Here's what he, you know what civilian life is? Civilian life is described as anything that happens outside of spiritual warfare. So anything you do outside of war and the spirit is considered civilian life. And Paul says the problem why soldiers aren't fighting is because they're tied up having to take their kids to soccer practice. They're tied up having to work a 12 hour a day job. They're tied up having to go to band practice and music practice and Friday night at the movies and Monday night with the family night and we can't come to prayer because it's family night. You want to know where you should be having family night? It's at the altar in travail, praying and crying out before God. Friend, you've got to understand it's the things of life. We should have, now this is not going to go well with any of you. I'm just going to say it before I say it, okay? Don't worry, I won't talk about Disney because every time I do that, I lose 500 followers, so I'm not going to talk any about... It should be hard for you to find pleasure in going and watching a secular movie. It should be hard for you to find pleasure listening to secular music. It should be hard for you to find pleasure going off on week-long vacations without prayer and worship. Friend, when I got saved, I only knew ungodly relationships. I was in the relationship for four years, about to marry this girl. I get radically saved. I break up with her. My wife gets saved a month after the revival breaks out, a month after I get saved. A year and a half later, I get married. And when I got married, I literally was like, we didn't know what to do because after being in revival, we didn't want to go to the movies. We didn't want to go to concerts. Uh, she, she's watching right now. She even tried taking me to a baseball game and I was just bored the whole time and everything we tried to do was tasteless and it was boring because the soldiers don't get tied up in civilian life. Friend, do you know that when soldiers come back from war, soldiers come back from war, I was watching a documentary and they struggle to go to the grocery store. They struggle to go to movie theaters. They struggle to drive a car. They call it PTSD. They can't do anything because they're so used to war that civilian life is uncomfortable, it's abnormal, and it makes them feel uncomfortable. That is exactly where God has called you. He has called you to a realm where you are uncomfortable not engaging daily in spiritual warfare, where you are uncomfortable sitting through five hours of the office and then falling asleep 10 minutes in prayer. You are uncomfortable binge watching Netflix, Hulu, Instagram, YouTube Premium, Disney Plus. This is why many of us have no problem dressing our kids up like demons. Like John Romero says, the little mermaid, that's the marine spirit. I had people tell me for years, I preached against harvest festivals, which is, you get in trouble if you do that. You won't get invited anywhere. I preached against Halloween. I said it was demonic. And people said, oh, brother, you're going to mess your girls up. I have four girls, six, four, two, and new. I have four little babies. Yeah, I said new, newborn. Okay, I call her new. And people said, well, she's not going to build. Your kids will never live a normal life if you don't let them dress up. And I said, I don't ever want my kids to live a normal life. Well, brother, if your kids, if your kids don't do this, and if your kid's not the head cheerleader, and if your son's not the head quarterback, they're this, they're going to really miss out. Friend, you know my prayer for my daughters? My prayer is that, God, I want them to miss out on everything the world has to offer. I, what are they going to miss out on? Young people, what are you going to miss out on? Depression, anxiety, fear, suicide anger, divorce, hatred. I'm telling you, stand to your feet. I want to miss out on everything that the enemy has. And I want everything God has called me to do. I want to be a deliverer in this last day generation. I want breakthrough and revival. This is our season.